Is it worth it? Let's find out. Let's go. Thanks for coming, I appreciate it. You found your way over to the Modest Audiophile channel. My name is Mark, and today we're gonna go over a bit of a treat. Yeah, The Doors debut. Analog Productions, 45 RPM, all analog. We'll get back to this in a second. So, let me kind of prime the pump here a little bit. It's an album that we've, most of us have all loved, right? Had it, or listened to it time and time and time again. I've never owned this Analog Productions. I've been kicking it around in my head for the better part of a couple of years. It's been in print, out of print, couldn't find it. Anyway, I was watching um, the In Grooves YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago, and Mike puts one out every week about you know some of the new arrivals and some of the pre-orders and restocks. And this one was a restock, and I just uh, I just had to do it. I Went in there and placed the order, and uh, two weeks later I got it. And am I oh so happy. We'll get to more of that in a second here. But uh, I'm not going to go into any in-depth background. Hey, this is The Doors' debut. Everybody knows about it. All you folks know about it. But we're going to go through uh, really what the sound stage is like, what it sounds like. Um, you know, if you're like me and you can't go get the unobtainium, pressing like the Monarch pressing, which I've heard is fantastic, and, and all these original pressings from 67 that you're not gonna get your hands on, or they're so flipping expensive for a clean copy that uh, I went out and got this. And this is something that um, that's readily available to, to anybody today who's got uh, $59.99 to spend. Boy, am I glad I did. All right, so let's kind of go over a couple things really quick and then we'll get on to how it sounds. All right, The Doors debut. This was recorded at Sunset Sound in Hollywood, California. It was recorded in August 1966 over about a week. And it was released on January 4th, 1967. A couple things about the recording that we'll, I wanted to bring to your attention and then we'll, uh, we'll get on to how it sounds, okay? So real quick. A four-track tape machine was used at the cost of approximately $10,000. Three of the tracks were used as bass and drums on one, guitar and organ on another, and Morrison's vocals on a third track. The fourth track was used for overdubbing, which were mainly for Morrison's harmony vocals and bass guitar. We'll get to that harmony vocals in a couple songs down the road, which really jumped out at me. The album's instrumentation includes keyboards, electric guitar, occasional bass, um, in addition to Ray's right, uh, keyboard bass, uh, drums, and a marxophone on Alabama song. I did not know what a marxophone was, but I do now. Rothschild, the producer, had forbidden Krieger from using any of his guitar effects, particularly the wah-wah pedal on the record in order to avoid what Rothschild thought was an overuse of these devices. However, the studio was equipped with an echo chamber which gave that specific effect to the sound and boy did it ever give an effect to the sound, frankly, that I haven't heard before. Let's go through the packaging really quick and then we'll get on to the important stuff. So, just like you saw in the intro of the packaging, right, it's um, analog production so it comes with all of these uh, I'll put the pictures here while we're going through it, right? The 100% Analog Masters sticker that's on here, the Analog Productions Guarantee, Original Master Tapes, Heavyweight Vinyl, Unmatched QC, Deluxe Packaging and Limited Edition. Less than a hundred, I'm sorry, re less than a thousand records per stamper released in limited quantities. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. And I'll put the picture up here as well. All right, now, since it's Analog Productions, the packaging is always top-notch, right? I think it's done by Stoughton Printing, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, you get this high-gloss... Shit, I mean, look at that. You can see the, the lights from my cameras over here. High-gloss, very good stock as far as the cardboard goes. Make sure you can see that. Great picture inside, and you get all the lyrics right here. Thick cardboard. On the 
On the back side, you've got, that's the back cover right there. And uh, again, thick, thick cardboard stock here. The only thing that you got inside of it was, uh, I think it's a, yeah, Acoustic Sounds promo, right? You've got this here. And just a promo. Nice promo though, no doubt about that. All right, now I will say, I also got this. You do get the, um, the quality record pressing uh, poly sleeves that do come with all of the analog productions. I did get this, I got a service with this when I bought it from the InGroove online and I asked for the sonic cleaning as well. So in addition to the two records being sonically cleaned, I get a MoFi inner sleeve and I get a, a nice poly outer sleeve as well. So, all right, that's that. So, how does it sound? All right, so how does it sound? Well, let's set this up so um, everyone's familiar with how I'm listening to it. So, I'm listening to this on my Audio-Technica LP120 turntable, which is going through a project two box S2 with upgraded Genelex Golden Lion tubes going into my Rotel A11 Tribute integrated amp and out these Wharfdale Denton 85th Anniversary Edition speakers. And I'm sitting 10 feet away, speakers are 10 feet apart. Now I did a couple dB checks with the volume set at 74. Okay, the first one I did on Soul Kitchen and the low end was 60 dBs, high end was 95 for an average of 84 decibels. And then I did one more dB check, I think on the next song actually, and that was Crystal Ship. And the low end was 69, the high end was 95, and the average was 84. Very good listening experience at those decibels. Um, I did uh, subsequently for a listening or two later, I, I did boost up the volume a bit more. Uh, I listened to this thing pretty much flat out straight for about four days. Fantastic listen, and we'll get through some of these songs here right now. The soundstage, with any analog productions. Oh, one more thing I want to do say about the, um, about this, the source material for this. It is an all analog. From what I understand, though, this was taken from a safety tape. Okay, and this was uh, mastered by Doug Sachs, I believe. So I'll put the information here below uh, from the Discog site. But yes, I believe that it's fairly well known that the original master tapes on this was, they're not in the best of conditions after all of these years. So this Analog Productions, which was, I believe, done in 2012 or 2014, again, that stuff will come out on the on the Discogs picture that I'll put up. But regardless, this one is being taken from a safety tape of the original master tape. So again, an old an original tape, but I think it's one generation off of the original. I don't know. It's a safety tape. Yeah, let's get onto the sound stage on this thing. It is wide, six feet plus on both sides. And yes, as far as the height goes, this thing was getting up towards my ceiling, which is five feet above the speakers. And depth on this album, this album had tremendous depth and I would say that it's you know five feet ish meaning it's coming it, at some points it's coming from behind the wall my speakers are three feet in front of the wall at some points in your mind's eye the depth of this uh, of this recording was coming out from outside of my room all the way into a couple feet inside the room the clarity, we'll just say this, the clarity of the, the tapes, of the music, of the sounds that you're hearing here is really, really good. And uh, you do get that sense of depth in this album, uh, unlike a lot of others. Another thing I'll say in regards to the depth is that you're getting a sense of different placements of where you're sitting. So for the majority of this album, I had gotten the sense where I'm literally in a club in my mind's eye where I'm sitting down, the stage is elevated a bit in front of me, maybe about two or three feet, right? And the band's up on the stage playing. That's how I visualized it mostly, except for a couple songs that we'll get into here in a few minutes. For the most part, again, the, um, the sound stage was presenting itself like you're in a club 
and you're watching this band in front of you. Uh, very, very cool. The bass was big and full and not thin in any way. I heard, I saw some um, reviews on Discogs where some people said that this has too much bass. Are you kidding me? Again, on my system, no, not too much bass. Really, really good, well-rounded bass though. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I was a bit surprised of how, um, how good the bass was. The mids, of course, excellent mids. Great vocals, great guitar, great piano. Upper mids into the treble. You're getting a lot of those sparkly highs. Um, cymbal shimmers are second to none. Second to none on any recording that I have. The shimmers that you got from the cymbals are fantastic. You get a lot of high-end detail. Not analytical, but yeah, you, you get maybe a, a slightly warm presentation, but yes, the, the sparkles and the highs and the trebles are all there. Fine detail, yet not analytical. Really, really good. I was surprised how good this sounded. Um, some, of the t some of the words that I was coming up as far as the tones go, the tonality goes. First of all, I put down, you can hear everything. Everything. Everything from echoes within the sound studio. You can hear breathing. It is, you get that, such a sense of being in the same space while they're recording this or again, in your mind's eye at a cl small club in there in front of you playing this. You can hear everything. The, uh, the decay that you were hearing in the room, maybe that came from the echo chamber that we talked about earlier on how it was recorded, but yeah, you can hear everything on this recording. I put a carnival of sound. You're getting a, a guttural type of tonality coming out of these, uh, the Jim's vocals and Robbie's guitar. I've, I've said this before. I'll say this a few times in regards to this review getting a bit of a religious experience, if I'm being honest, certainly when it came to uh, the last song on the album. We'll get to that in a few minutes. All right, let's talk about some of the songs and what really I was able to pull out of, out of some of the songs that I, I maybe not necessarily have heard before, and really what set this record apart from any other version I've heard of this, of this record. Now, if I heard the Monarch pressing, Nope. Again, like I said, that's unobtainium for me. I'm not going to chase it down, and if I did, I'm not going to spend the money to, uh, to, to, get, to get that record, which may not be as overall as good as this one, if that makes any sense at all. Um, not for the money, anyway. I've heard this album, right, mostly in the past on CDs, um, cassette tapes when I was younger. I've never heard this on vinyl. The first record, never heard it on vinyl. So this was a bit of a treat for me. All right, side one starts with break on through to the other side. And I just, first thing I put here, all the detail. You know it's coming. You know it's coming out of the left where uh, Densmore's drums and you hear that, you, know, you, you hear the, the cymbals and it's right here. It's, it's right here on the left side of the sound stage. It was uh, right away, you're going, oh, oh this is going to be fun. And fun it was. Um, I put gritty and powerful. Robbie's guitar is so sharp and punchy coming out of the right side. Uh, and then at the end of this song, again, maybe because of that echo chamber, I don't know. But the decay at the end of the song was miraculous. You can just hear it. The decay until uh, until until the song you know signs off. Really, really good. I I haven't quite heard it like that before. And what a way to start the album off. Um, yeah, good stuff. Into the second song, Soul Kitchen. I put uh, this is how this is how they this is how the band presents itself in pretty much all the songs here. Okay, you've got uh, Jim is center, center left. The vocals are coming three feet in that center image, three feet high, meaning three feet higher than my, than the, uh, three feet higher than the tweeters on my speaker. And on the right is Robbie's guitar. On the left, D Densmore's drums. A bass is center left, but in this case, center left uh, on the bottom. And uh, raised keys are usually somewhere center left as well. Um, 
Soul Kitchen, I've never heard it like this before. It was great. It was the most articulate, most hearing everything you can possibly hear out of, out of this song. I heard it on this album. Fantastic. All right, now, as we go into the third song, the first time I put this on, right after I got it in the mail, I had, uh, I was rushing around, right? Rushing around, I'm like, all right, I gotta listen to this, I'm all excited. And I sat down, I listened to Break On Through, and I listened to Soul Kitchen, I went, huh, okay. Yeah, it's immediate, it's in your, kind of in your face a bit. It sounds excellent, but I go, yeah. It's not really filling out the whole sound stage. Now, it did, but I was my ears are still getting accustomed to what I was listening to here. The third song came on, the crystal ship, and the entire sound stage just opened up. Or that's when my ears just opened up to this uh, to the way this music was presenting itself. But whatever happened, it clicked on the crystal ship, and with that. With Jim's vocals being so haunting on this and the reverb oozing out of it, everything just kind of, yeah, this was a great listen. This, the Crystal Ship really opened up my ears for the rest of this album. And the piano on this is center left. And again, you can see with your mind's eye every single note that Ray's, Ray is playing. Um, it's just, I just put here, this song clicked me in on the first listen. So what a wonderful presentation of the crystal ship, man. It was it was fantastic. And I'll get and then what I will say, I listened to the whole first side again after I finished the rest of the album to make sure that my ears were uh, in tune, so to speak, with the way the sound stage was presenting itself. And again, yeah, break on through, opened up, and um, Soul Kitchen opened up as well. So yeah, fantastic. But when I first heard the Crystal Ship, oh, it was it was almost like having an epiphany listening to it. It was fantastic. And then to round off the last song on the first side is 20th Century Fox. And the first thing I put here is, man, great to hear that song again. I don't hear that song too often anymore. And it was a real pleasure. It gave me flashbacks to being a kid. The, uh, the opening, right, with Robbie on the right side with that sweet guitar, the way that 20th Century Fox opens in, it was just oozing tonality coming out of the right-hand side. Big, full bass was spilling out into the soundstage, filled up the entire lower section of the soundstage. The bass was fantastic. This may have the best bass arguably on, well, on, the, on the whole album. It certainly didn't get any better than this. This was really good. Uh, and then I put the chorus was huge. This song was a big surprise. It wasn't just your, uh, it wasn't the same old song that you, you would hear on the radio from time to time back in the day. This song was presented itself awesome. And then I just kept forgetting how much I really, really enjoyed this album. It's probably my favorite Doors album, arguably my favorite Doors album. There's a lot of good ones, but this one's special. On to side two. Hey everybody, I just want to say thank you. If you're a first timer here to the Modest Audiophile channel, I hope you like what you see. If you do, don't be shy, hit that like button. For those of you that are coming back, or I call repeat offenders, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it, it means something to me. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, yeah, go down there, don't be shy, hit the subscribe button, it's free. You can always take it away later. Enough of that, let's get back on to the rest of this killer analog productions of The Doors debut. It's freaking awesome. Again, boys and girls, we're talking about a 45 RPM record, so there's gonna be four sides here. And side two starts with Alabama Song with the Marxophone. I'll put a picture here. Very cool instrument. Um, didn't know what it was. What I put here was is you're definitely in the club listening to this, the way it presented itself, right? You're sitting at a table, whatever, on the floor and uh, having a drink and, and the band is playing right in front of you. Deep sound stage, very deep sound stage. And you're getting a, in a very immediate type of presentation. Like I said, it's, it's hard to put into words right now, but so lifelike. Um, that marxophone keyboard, you are, the imaging is showing it where you're, 
you're seeing every note being played across the, uh, the, the sound stage when you close your eyes and, and you see it with your mind's eye. Kind of trippy, pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, very holographic, I put. Excellent highs slash treble. This is one of the songs that really showcases uh, what your system can do as far as treble goes. The highs were sparkly and they were exquisite. Really, really good. I heard new cymbals decaying on the left side of the soundstage that I've never heard before. That was cool, frankly. I wasn't even so sure that the cymbals, I mean, hearing this, uh, I heard so many new things coming out of this album for, for me. Again, like I talked to earlier, most of the songs, most of the time I've heard this album, it's been on anything but a modestly priced hi-fi system. Um, and hearing it now, boy, it, on, this, on this analog productions piece, fan, fantastic. Yeah, after, after that new cymbal decay, you know that part where Jim just says, yeah. That was, he's right there in the room. And, and it, gave, it gave a distinction to space within the soundstage as well. Um, yeah, the, what I put here as well, now this came out prior to Sgt. Pepper, right? This came out same year, but this came out prior to Sgt. Pepper by about six months maybe. This came out in January. Would Pepper come out in like uh, June maybe? Anyway, on the Sgt. Pepper album, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, right? You get that hurdy-gurdy, carnival of sound type of effect. Well, these guys did it first and may I, I may even say they may have done it better. Um, I put here, may have outdone being for the benefit of Mr. Kite with that, uh, just that, that circus type of atmosphere you're hearing in the soundstage. Man, it, I, I'm at a loss for words here. It was so fun. It was the best and most enjoyable I have ever heard, heard this song. Um, you know, in the song, I've heard it in the live albums, I've heard it on, on a couple other versions of it, but it was, I won't say it was a throwaway song. Man, this is one of the most entertaining songs on the album. Uh, might be the price of admission right there, because I don't think you're getting this type of sense well, you're certainly not getting it on the CDs that I've heard. Uh, maybe you're getting it on that Monarch pressing if it's not too damaged. But man, uh, Alabama song on this on this Analog Productions, fantastic. Listen, really fantastic. Listen. Second song on side two is "Light My Fire." Now, coming from Alabama song, where you're right here, really close, or you, it's being presented to you like you're in the club. On the uh, on "Light My Fire." This is one of two songs on the album where the soundstage kind of pushes back a little bit further, or you are a little bit further removed from the stage. This one presents itself more like you're in a theater, like an Orpheum Theater, uh, the Wang Center in, um, in, in Boston, where maybe you're, you know, I don't know, maybe you're like 100 feet back, we'll say that, from the stage. The, st the soundstage is still really wide, and it still has depth, but you're farther removed from the stage, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it was a nice wide sound stage. And again, this is pretty much wow, every, just like every other song where the band sits, sits. You got the drums on the left, keyboards on the right. Jim is center. The bass is center right in this case I have down here. I put Robbie's solo is the clearest I've ever heard it. Um, hearing some overtones coming out of that amp as well. Yeah, his solo, the sound of it. You again, I was picking up overtones coming out of that uh, guitar and amp combo. There it was pretty cool. Um, drums on the left have been some of the cleanest, clearest drum sounds I've ever heard on any recording, and that's pretty much across the board for the rest of the album. Here, the drums are so so articulate and clear sounding and we'll get to a couple more songs here in a few minutes really really good um, and then to end this and during the fade out you're hearing the um, you're hearing Robbie's amp just kind of buzz a little bit during the fade out and I never picked up on that before you're you've got so much detail here in this recording that it's so fun to pick up things that you may not have heard before that you, or that you overlooked before really fun 
All right, now we'll get on to side three. Side three, start this may, I can't, I can't keep saying, well, this might be my favorite song on the album, or this might be my favorite song on the album. Well, this is my favorite song on this side, I'll tell you that. Backdoor Man, it starts off with. And the first thing I put here is the most vivid and powerful beginning I've ever heard this song. You know how it starts. And on, on this recording or on this, on this record, Analog Productions coming out of this system, it was so powerful. Jim's grunts, right? You know how it starts. And then Jim is kind of grunting and saying, oh yeah, and all this other stuff. And he's, he's right there, center left. And of course, he's not doing it to the mic the same way every time. He's backed off the mic a bit. And you can get that sense when you're listening to it, that sense of depth very holographic um, to start off this song. And I just put, what a build up, right? You've got the, uh, all, the instrument, all the instruments coming in, Jim's grunts, and then the thing just kind of drives into its groove. Oh, fantastic build up to the song. I said you can almost touch the drums on the left. I mean, you could almost touch them if you got up out of your chair and walked three feet over. They were right there. I put great bass on this, everything. This is the best version I've ever heard this song. And it's arguably now my favorite song on the album. Arguably. It's, it's, it's probably about six or seven songs that are my favorite on this album. After listening to this probably about a dozen times in the last four or five days. Awesome. Backdoor man. Put it on. Get back to your chair quickly because there's a quick... Uh, at 45 RPMs, this thing comes up fast. So put the needle down, get back to your chair. And the way this song starts off, it's a punch into the chest. It's fantastic. It really is the best I've ever heard. All right, let's go on to song number two, I Looked At You. I put nice drum intro on the left. The bass fills out the bottom of the sound stage. Really good bass on the song as well. And Jim is there again, center, just left of center. Vocals are so, so clear on this song. And the cool thing that I picked up on this one is, right, they opened up that fourth track for overdubs and you've got Jim singing the main lyrics right there in the center, about three feet high in the, in the center of the image. But his backing vocals are coming from over, over his shoulder. Um, uh, looking at the sound stage, you're coming from over his shoulder on the left. And you can, yeah, they're, they're very visual where you can see almost like two images of Jim in your mind's eye, one right on top of each other. Um, it's probably not coming out the way I want it to, but yeah, really, really cool uh, being able to see with your mind's eye Jim singing with Jim. Really nice. Now we go into song three on side three, End of the Night. <laughs> what I put here is it's like surf music on acid. And it's all that reverb in the guitar. I mean, this is, this is like, this is surf music reverb. Turn it way up and it's soupy and swampy and it's glorious. But what you're getting is um, the tones that they were using, the notes that, that Robbie was playing. This isn't your typical surf music. Again, it was like, it was like a swampy, trippy surf music. It was fantastic. But the reason why I want to call that out is because then on the left-hand side of the soundstage, the drums were so crisp and so clear, and you layer the crispness of the drums against the soupy reverb of everything else. And it was cool. It was a cool effect. Um, again, not one of the songs that I'm calling up first, but man, did it play well on this Analog Productions album. Fantastic. All right, take it to the last song on side three, and that's Take It As It Comes. And it's such a stark contrast from the Swamp Fest that you had in the song previous that you really took notice. This thing was sharp, it had great detail, and it was the second song where the, the soundstage was pushed back a little bit. On um, the end of the night, the previous song, the Swampy one, the reverb, you're again in the club again, and you're, you're really close to the stage. And then on this last song on side three, take it as it comes, you're pushed back a little bit. Not quite as far as you were with Light My Fire, 
but you're you're definitely in a theater, maybe a little bit closer in the theater, but nonetheless, you're not in the club any longer, if that makes sense. All right, let's get back to uh, side four, which has one song all to itself. The end. Now, what I said about this one, first off, is I put religious war versus religious experience, right? What I mean about religious war is, oh, this is the best pressing, this is the best pressing, oh, it's the monarch pressing, which, again, unobtainium, nobody can get their hands on. Certainly I can't. Forget all the religious war stuff. Just listen to this album and to end it with this, this last song on the entire side, 11 minutes plus. It was a religious experience listening to the end, let me tell you. And I've got, I've got a few things here, right, that I'll, put, uh, that, I'll, that I'll try and get through quick. I put the end. This should be a historical document. It was fantastic. You're back in the club again. You're, you're there. And um, the clarity in vivid detail you're getting out of this, right, it starts off with Robbie's guitar <clears throat> playing on the right. It's got that droning effect. I don't know if he's in an open tune, it may be open D or something. But you're getting that, that, uh, that droning, really crisp guitar on the right. And then the drums start on the left. Again, so, so flipping clear. The bass comes in and fills out the rest of the sound stage. And then you've got what I put, you got that tambourine on the left, right? It is the most vivid, realistic tambourine I've ever heard in my life. I wanted to reach out and grab it. You could hear the flutter of the tambourine. You can hear it, you know, hitting the tambourine. The tambourine on this thing is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I've never heard anything like it on any recording that I have. To have that instrument, the tambourine, being so vividly clear and literally within arm's reach of where I'm sitting, 10 feet away. Fantastic. Yeah, I said, you are there in the club. You've got the, the keyboard center right, vocal center left. When he comes to the, to the line waiting for the summer rain, it fills up the entire flipping room. Again, you know, this happened a lot during my listening of David Crosby's um, solo debut, if I can only remember my name. The whole room became the soundstage. This song was like that. It was, it was immense coming from outside of the space. Man, it was great. Um, and then after the next, the next line, Ride the King's Highway. It, during that moment, it was very, very vivid, very holographic, very 3D. Again, in your mind's eye, having yourself sitting there in the club watching this. And then, you know, once the pace starts to pick up, right after, you know, uh, come on, baby, take a chance with us. And he goes, come on, yeah. Right? That's when Robbie and the rest of the band start to kick it in as far as pace and volume explodes in the room. The room is just rocking at this point. And you get that guttural feedback that is so powerful, more powerful than I've heard it on, again, any other recording. Mostly CDs, if not all CDs. I've never experienced this song this way. In fact, it made me think, again, this came out prior, this came out in 67, certainly came out before Beatles' White Album, right, when they did Helter Skelter. And the only thing I can compare it to is, you know, at the end of Helter Skelter, before it fades off and before it comes back, when Ringo says, I got blisters on my fingers, you get that sense of that almost out of control feedback. These guys did it beforehand, and they did it better. Oh, man, it was great. And then coming out of that, that feedback, you got Densmore just slaps that, that snare on the left. It almost startles you because it's so damn clear. Um, yeah, it had, then the sharp snare hit, bang, and then you know, Jim goes into the last, uh, the last verse and mellows out the song after that. Um, yeah. Religious war, religious war versus religious experience. I'll take the religious experience anytime. Forget the religious war. This was so much fun to listen to. Uh, I enjoyed it every single time I listened to it. Again, I, normally when I do these reviews, I listen to an album 
maybe about four times, a couple times just to listen through, to enjoy it, and then the second or the third and fourth time, I'll, I'll start writing notes. Now, I, I listened to this thing probably about eight times be, just for fun before I even started thinking about taking notes. What a, what a listen. So that's it, everybody. I really appreciate you coming for the ride on this one. This was a fantastic album, and I so thoroughly enjoyed it. So do yourself a favor. Yeah, go out there. You can still find this thing. Go out there and find it. Make an event out of it. Get it home. Unpackage it. Kick back in your favorite listening room, chair, whatever it may wind up being. Put it on the turntable. Get your favorite beverage. And... Just wait for the experience. Maybe it won't be a religious experience for you, but it'll be an experience nonetheless. And I'd be really curious to, to have you put in the comments what your thoughts were when you first listened to this Analog Productions 45 RPM, all analog pressing of The Doors debut album. Did you, did, you, did you feel the same way I did? This thing was incredible. Couldn't have been more happier with this purchase. 60 bucks, 59.99, it is well worth it for me. All right, that's it. This is going to be the last review that I'm doing in this house because we are moving next week. And we'll be in the new place in a week after that. So with that being said, uh, I hope to get a couple more videos out, but they won't be reviews because i got to pack up the, uh, I gotta pack up the modestly, high -fi, the modestly priced hi-fi system. Uh, but what we may do is a couple uh, sneak peeks about what I want to do in the new house. I want to talk about setting up a new listening room. Maybe we'll talk about some of my best digital files that I'm co contemplating putting out, and contemplating getting on analog. Anyway, we'll figure it out over the course of the next couple weeks. Until then, thanks. Take care of yourself, and we'll be back soon. Bye.